morning. So, um, so I'm David Gross and I'm actually, even though I'm a day late, um, I'm the director of this school and it's great to be back. I gather that yesterday went very well and had some marvelous lectures. Um, and the school, this school seems really exciting, lots of interesting stuff. So let's begin today with uh, Sobir Sajdev, a very noted string theorist, <laughs> <laughs> who in recent years has gotten interested in condensed matter theory. <laughs> <laughs> and he is the, of course, the S, uh, the SYK model, which has been a focus of interest in the last few years, uh, bridging Quantum critical points in condensed matter theory, study of chaos in quantum systems, and of course, uh, the simplest holographic um, string theory, but we're not sure exactly what the string theory is yet, uh, that we know of. Subir has been uh, A, if not B, leading figure in this field, and uh, is going to give a series of lectures on SYK and its applications. Super. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much, David. Uh, always great to be here in Jerusalem. Uh, so I gather all of you are also all condensed matter theorists, I'm going to assume from now on. <laughs> uh, so my plan is to have, is this okay? Well, mic in the right place. Um, my plan is to have, uh, it seems a little loud, isn't it? Okay, I'm hearing some echoes. That's good. good, okay. Uh, actually, I'm not planning to talk about SYK all the way through, uh, but the first two lectures will be a condensed matter perspective on the SYK model. Uh, I will focus on two aspects. One is, of course, its connection to black holes, which probably more great interest to you, uh, but also why, you know, why is it that in, uh, we started studying in the first place? Why is it important for condensed matter? Uh, and, and that gives a somewhat different perspective, I, I believe. So also, I, I suspect there will be lectures by Douglas Stanford and Igor Klebanov on related things. Uh, and all of those models that, that they will talk about are related to so-called Majorana models, or where the fermions are particle hole symmetric. Uh, that's not of direct interest to condensed matter. Uh, we're interested in case where the have, you have actual electrons, which are complex fermions. Um, you get Majoranas in, in the real world only if you have superconductivity. So I won't really talk about superconductivity today or this week. Um, so I'm going to talk about what is now starting to be called the complex SYK model. Uh, and, uh, but it was actually the original, uh, very closely related to the original model uh, that uh, Jin Wu Ye, my first student, and I proposed. In, uh, now it's almost 26 years ago in 1993. <laughs> oh no, 20, yeah, 25 last wow. year. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, but anyway, so so the general interest here, uh, our interest at that time, even today, was uh, sparked by what's called the strange metal problem. So there are these uh, high temperature superconductors, and all of them, in addition to having high temperature superconductivity also have a metallic phase at higher, somewhat higher temperatures, uh, which doesn't look like any of the other ordinary metals as we call them now. Um, and so we were searching for some kind of solvable model of a, what people call a non-Fermi liquid. Um, and so what I want to do is just since this is given the make of the audience, first quickly review what is an ordinary metal 
and what are its basic properties? Uh, why, why is it, from a field theory point of view, actually quite an unusual object? Uh, and then go on to uh, introduce the complex SYK model and, and some of its basic properties. So more generally, you can think about what I'm talking about uh, is study of, uh, other than saying metals, a more general way to define what a metal is, uh, it's a phase of compressible quantum matter. So what do I mean by compressible quantum matter? Well, you have some Hamiltonian, uh, and then you have a conserved U1 charge. Uh, Q. So this means a Hamiltonian, let's call this H0, uh, co commutes with Q. Uh, and then you deform the Hamiltonian uh, by adding a term with a chemical potential coupling to Q. So this would be going to the grand canonical ensemble in statistical mechanics. Um, and then you ask for what is the expectation value of the operator Q uh, in the full Hamiltonian as t goes to zero. Um, so a compressible state is one which, first of all, this is non-zero, but more importantly, it's tunable. That is, the compressibility, k, which is dq d mu, how does it change uh, as you change the chemical potential at t equals zero? So it's very important that you be exactly at t equals zero. So you change the chemical potential. Now, since H0 uh, commutes with Q, changing the value of mu doesn't change any of the energy eigenstates. All the eigenstates remain exactly the same. They just rearrange in energy. Uh, and as they rearrange, it could be that the ground state also changes. And if the ground state changes, then at t equals 0, the compressibility could be non-zero. So from this, you can see immediately that if you have an energy gap, then this is just 0. Because if you change the chemical potential a little bit, there's no way the ground state can interchange uh, with some excited state which is above a gap. Uh, and so any state with a gap uh, is incompressible. OK, so you need a state, you need gapless states. Uh, and then you can ask, we'll start looking at uh, you know, what is the compressibility of the gapless states that you know. So if you're a field theorist, all gapless states are conformal field theories. So let's ask, what is, what is the compressibility for a conformal field theory? Uh, so for a CFT, uh, let's say in D spatial dimensions, so I'm going to use little d for spatial, capital D for space time. Uh, the dimension of the charge uh, is D. So if you imagine computing k, the dimension of uh, K, the dimension of mu is always 1. That's the an energy. So dimension of k is d minus 1. So the compressibility by scaling, if you're looking at it as a function of temperature, will scale as t to the d minus 1. So, so this means that only in d equals 1, so only d equals 1, CFTs are compressible. OK. Uh, for, so any a higher dimensional CFT is incompressible. So for example, graphene, if you take a, a graphene has a massless dispersion spectrum. Charge density. Uh, yeah, density, sure. <laughs> Everything's per unit volume, thank you. Uh, so in graphene, if you put the chemical potential, this is, you get a CFT if the chemical potential is right there. Uh, and if you raise it, then the density of states right <laughs> at, the, uh, at the chemical potential vanishes. So the compressibility in graphene will vanish as a linear power of temperature. So at zero temperature, if you're a CFT with a chemical potential there, uh, then it's incompressible. Now, one dimension is special, of course, so I won't consider the case. I'm interested in higher dimensions. Uh, so there's really, at least from a, none of the CFTs of interest to us are compressible. So a metallic state is something that's compressible. You know, you take a, any metal, you can change the density of the metal at, at will, uh, and it's gapless. Now, why is that compressible? Well, it's compressible because your chemical potential is here. So if you put your mu here, so this is a, a metal or a Fermi liquid. So you've got all these states occupied. 
uh, and write at the chemical potential the density of states uh, is not zero. It's some fixed density of states as you learn uh, in sort of elementary solid state physics is a finite density of states. So having a finite density of state at zero energy is a very special property of a metal. Okay. Uh, and, and that's the kind of system we want to study. Uh, here I'm assuming they're all free electrons, but of course the basics of, uh, uh, of, free, of uh, Fermi liquid theory is that interactions don't change any of these properties, uh, the, uh, apart from renormalizing uh, various quantities, including the compressibility. Okay. Uh, there's another familiar example also of a compressible state, and that's a superfluid. In a superfluid, there's a Bose condensate, or whatever a condensate of pairs. When you change the chemical potential, you just add more bosons to the condensate, and you can change, have a superfluid any density you want. But in that case, you've broken this U1 symmetry. Okay, so this U1 symmetry is broken. It's really not preserved. So that's not really the kind of example we're looking for. So if you want to look for a state of matter in dimension greater than one, which is compressible, and which the U1 symmetry is not broken, well, basically, metals are it. Uh, Fermi liquids are, this, are the theory of the basic state of matter that's compressible in, in dimensions greater than one at zero temperature. Okay. Now, since the discovery of the high TC, people have been searching for other, formula, other states of matter that are compressible in higher dimension at zero temperature. Uh, and there have been you know, examples. You, you couple the Fermi surface to some critical boson. It goes to strong coupling. And in a few cases, you can establish it some degree of control. And there's been a huge amount of work on that. And maybe you do end up with states uh, that are compressible, but they're not very, yeah, which are not free fermions, essentially, uh, but still extremely hard to understand uh, and not well established. So the purpose of the uh, complex SYKV model was it turns out to be the other example of a solvable example other than a Fermi liquid, uh, which is compressible. And it also turns out not to be a Fermi liquid. It has lots of interesting properties, including connection to black holes. So that's, that's kind of where I want to go. All right, so but before I jump into the complex SYK model, let me review uh, a few basic properties still of a trivial compressible state. So we take the following Hamiltonian. H is, uh, okay. Um, I should say I have various slides and lecture notes that I'll, um, I will eventually get to you in the next few days. Uh, all the factors of two and signs, please refer to those. Uh, everything's going to be random on the board. Uh, <laughs> uh, so it's, it's sum on i, comma j, t i j, c dagger i, c j. So these are complex fermions, which means they anti-commute. C i, c j is delta i j, uh, and okay. So these are just ordinary creation annihilation operators, which are fermionic. Um, so this is just free fermions, uh, and Fermi liquid theory is about uh, states of matter with, with some band structure in the Tij and some interactions. So here we just look at the case where the Tij are random. So suppose the Tij are just random numbers uh, is zero, and Tij squared uh, is some T naught. Okay. Uh, so this is then becomes a random matrix model. Just Tij is the random. Uh, I'll take it to be complex. So it's a random Hermitian matrix. Uh, and again, there's a huge amount of work done on random matrices. Yes. Why is the between uh, CI and CI dagger? Oh, what did I say? Did I say something wrong? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. So so if I just take this uh, this Tij on its own. It's an n by n matrix, and every matrix element is random. And that's what's traditionally called random matrix theory. A huge amount of work was done in the 80s uh, on that random matrix theory, and just about even before, it was the Wigner Dyson. Uh, Wigner introduced it a long time ago. Uh, and essentially, everything is known about it. Uh, here, just for the purposes of illustration, I want to just say a few things about it, a few trivial things about it, not as viewed as a random matrix, but viewed as a many body problem. So as a many party problem, it has a somewhat uh, distinct structure, which then generalizes uh, to the more inter interesting uh, interacting many body problem. 
So how do we solve this as a many body problem? Well, you define a Green's function, G is some C of zero C of tau. Uh, is it the way? Yeah. Uh, with a minus sign in here. Um, and uh, you try to evaluate this just by perturbation theory in T. So G zero, okay, you add a chemical potential here. Uh, G zero is uh, I omega n plus mu in frequency space. Uh, and then you try to look at perturbation theory in T, and, and you discover that uh, it's extremely simple. Um, so the bare graph G is just one line, but then you have some T. So this is a fact, I mean, this dashed line is a factor of T, uh, and then you get. Uh, and so on, and so on. Okay, so this is in fact the entire theory, sum of all these graphs, and that's the complete theory. And if you knew the matrix Tij, you can just solve it by diagonalizing Tij. Yes. Uh, this, uh, uh, this model has kind of more structures than random matrix theory. So if I have a Gaussian random Hamiltonian, yeah. Well, I don't, well, okay, but, but once I know the eigenvalues and eigenstates of Tij, I can completely work out everything, all the property of this model. So it's just a matter of transforming one to the other. There's no new, in principle, I don't need any new information. I'm just going to solve it in a way that uh, is useful for my purposes. Uh, if I want to, for example, study the dis distribution, spacing distribution between the eigenvalues here, then my way is, is not the way to go. I won't be interested in anything to that level of precision. Uh, okay. Uh, so here is just a very simple way. You, you, this is the entire series, but we don't want to diagonalize Tij. We don't know the eigenvalues, so we just could look at the average. Uh, so when you average these, uh, because of this, the first term is zero. So this is zero, uh, and this becomes. Uh, you, so this means that they average together, and it gives you a factor of t naught squared, and then these labels becomes i j i. Okay, um, and you have to keep track of factors of n also, so there'll be one over n here. Okay, uh, this one is zero, but what's the next non-zero term? Well, there's two of them. There's this one. And then there's this one. Okay, and now these turn out to have a key difference. So here there's an i, this is a j, this is again an i, this is a k, and that's an i. Uh, and this thing has factors of the, pre, the overall p factor is t naught squared over n whole squared. Uh, and this one is also t naught squared over n whole squared. Uh, but now the indices work out very differently here. If this is i, that's j, uh, then this also has to be i that has to be j and whatever, okay, and that's an i in any case. So there's, the indices are much more constrained here. So now when you sum over the intermediate indices, when you sum over j and a sum over k, you get a factor of n squared here. Here there's only a j, so you get a factor of n, uh, and here there's a j, you get a factor of n. So you see that this one, this n cancels with this, this n cancels with that, and this one is 1 over n suppressed. Okay, so that's the basic effect that's going to be behind everything I'm going to talk about in more complex situations. Uh, so this can be ignored. And in fact, you can see uh, the whole thing is very simple. Uh, to all orders in 1 over n, the leading term, uh, sigma, the self-energy, is just t squared with a factor of the sign I don't remember, times g. So this is exact. What? T zero squared. Thank you. All right. So that's the that's the whole solution of the problem. So sigma is equal g sigma is equal to g, and g is equal to one over i omega n plus mu minus sigma. 
So you solve these two equations that is equivalent to solving a quadratic equation I presume you can do that uh, and so what do you get from this. So what do you get is uh, the famous semicircle density of states. So if you look at imaginary part of g of omega so let me call a rho of omega which is the imaginary part of g of omega you solve this uh, what you get is as a function of omega you get a semicircle so this is t naught squared uh, okay. So what you are instructed to do since you are viewing this as a many body problem is to fill all the at zero temperature you fill all the energy levels below mu and uh, so, so there is some mu here and so these states are filled uh, and these states are empty. Okay, in reality, you know, so this is the answer that you get in the large limit. In reality, what is happening uh, is that this, it's, this is not really the density of states. The actual density of states uh, is this, our discrete levels, and the spacing between these levels is one over n. Um, and the density of the levels gives you the semicircle states. Okay, and there's also various tails here and so on. And there's papers on everything, on all of those. This, the distribution of the spacing, the structure of the tails, that is what random matrix theory is all about. <laughs> but here we're looking at the limit where we're not interested in this spacing, we just uh, take the average. Okay. All right. Uh, so from this, you can now compute various things, and I won't go through any of the details. So this density of states here, let me just call that rho naught, and it's not equal to zero. Uh, that's all you need to know and you can in fact even linearize about this point and in fact you don't even need to worry about the slope for many properties all you need to know the value of rho naught and you can work everything out from it. So for example the compressibility uh, is rho naught as t goes to zero. Um, what else? Well you can compute the grand potential so it is some ground state energy. What is the ground state energy? It's just the sum of all these energy eigenvalues, if the one that you filled up. So it's proportional to n. So let me. Uh, then there'll be a mu here. So that's the, uh, yeah. Uh, and then you get a temperature-dependent correction. Well, that correction turns out to be minus. I'm going to write as minus, minus gamma squared over two. Uh, and therefore the entropy. S is minus d omega dt uh, to is, is, goes a, is equal to gamma t. So this is the famous linear, so the entropy vanishes at zero temperature uh, and it vanishes linearly in temp S over n, uh, linear in temperature. So that's the basic property of any Fermi liquid. Uh, the entropy vanishes, goes linear in temperature and there's thousands of experiments that have measured such things. And this is what we call the gamma coefficient in solid state physics. Uh, this gamma. Q is just a, sorry, Q is just a uh, number of fermions. Thank you. So that's the conserved U1 charge. That's why I want them complex. All right. Uh, another thing that uh, uh, I will, will need in a few minutes when I go to the complex case is what about the chemical potential? So you can think of this in two different ensembles and this is something that's done in every solid state physics course. You can fix the chemical potential and raise the temperature or you can fix the density and raise the temperature. You fix the density, meaning Q, and you raise the temperature, mu has to shift a little bit to compensate for that, okay? So what you find then at fixed Q, if you work that out from the famous Sommerfeld expansion, at fixed Q, mu is the zero temperature value minus some coefficient times temperature squared. So in fact, you don't have to worry about it too much. Uh, the fact that things are, there's a finite density of states and more importantly, uh, things are particle hole symmetric. If you ignore the slope at very low temperatures, uh, the number of states below the Fermi level and the number of states just above the Fermi level are practically equal. So when you raise the temperature, uh, the density doesn't ch hardly changes uh, because uh, the number of extra st states you empty here is roughly equal to the number of states you add there. 
Now, when you account for the fact there's a tiny slope, then there's a small correction, and that's this C depends on the slope of the density of states. Okay, C is supposed to be rho rho prime of e. Okay, uh, that uh, okay. All right, um, and this you can also write in the following way, and I'm preparing yourself to what to come. Uh, that d mu dt uh, at fixed q um, is equal to ct, which tends to zero. Okay, and this is in fact related to the fact that the entropy is uh, has vanished at zero temperature. That's the third law of thermodynamics. Uh, so there's a Maxwell relation, which will be crucial for my uh, discussion. Uh, which is that the derivative of the entropy with respect to charge, okay, and again, I'm going to forget the sign here. I think there's a minus sign. Is the derivative of the chemical potential with respect to temperature uh, at fixed Q. Yeah, so this, this simply follows from various thermodynamic identities. Uh, you know, both the left and the right-hand side uh, are the second derivative of omega with mu T. So if you use that fact, you get the famous Maxwell relation. So if d mu dt vanishes, this means that ds dq also vanishes, uh, and as temperature goes to zero, and it surely does because s vanishes as temperature goes to zero. Okay. <laughs> All right. So any questions? So that's a lightning review of some very basic facts about not just the random matrix model, but any Fermi liquid have all of these properties, even with interactions. So you, in this case, you can add interactions. Uh, and find they don't change uh, apart from various normalization, this basic structure. Uh, you can conserve momentum. Again, it doesn't matter very much. Uh, um, yeah, okay, so then you're right. So then this is, uh, this is not omega, it's F, something like that. <laughs> uh, it's the Helmholtz free energy, not the grand potential. Uh, anyway. Again, all these are in the notes. You can look at it. This is just very simple. Uh, <coughs> uh, right. So uh, the answer should be the same in any ensemble because I'm taking n goes to infinity. It's just a choice of what variables are used to express things in. But of course, you have to be very careful in taking these partial derivatives. You have to remember what's here. Yeah. All right. OK. Uh, any other questions? Uh, yeah, so there's another property which I might just mention in passing. You can put in uh, small inter interactions. Suppose I put in interactions. Uh, then you can ask the following question. Uh, suppose I remove a particle from here. So I have a hole sitting here right near the Fermi level. Now if I remove a particle and I have no interaction, it's going to sit there forever. Uh, but now you can ask how long does it take before this particle is scattered out into uh, some state that's unoccupied. Uh, so the lifetime of a particle or a quasi-particle, if you have interaction, uh, roughly goes as, uh, so the lifetime, well, let me do, let me do lifetime inverse. It'll be second order in the interaction. So, so let's have the interaction U, this interaction U, uh, U squared. Uh, and it goes temperature squared, and now you have to make the dimensions work out. I'm not writing something right. Well, anyway. So there'll be some factors of uh, rho naught squared uh, or rho naught cubed. I forget. Anyway. Well, let me not try to get that right. So it, it'll be tw it goes in interaction squared and temperature squared. Uh, and does everyone know where this temperature squared comes from? Uh, it comes from Fermi's golden rule. Uh, maybe I should just write that out. Uh, do you need a reminder? <laughs> You probably do. Okay, uh, where is this lifetime coming from? So, uh, the way you compute this, um, you know, you have, think of it as a scattering process. You have particle coming in and going out. This is particle one, two, three, four, and the lifetime of particle one uh, basically goes in interaction squared and various matrix elements. But the important thing now is that this state has to be full and these two have to be empty. 
So you have f of e2 that has to be full. This is the Fermi function, uh, 1 minus f of e3 uh, and 1 minus f of e4 and then an energy conservation function delta E1 plus E2 minus E3 minus E4. Okay, well you just evaluate and you integrate over 2, 3, 4. Uh, so you do this integral, out will pop this answer. Uh, it's only right, uh, when you write at the Fermi, uh, uh, if you had low temperature and exactly at the Fermi level, there's so few states to scatter from and so few states to scatter into that everything vanishes as temperature goes to zero. Okay, so this is a gapless state, but quasi-particles, as we say, this, this thing is going to live for a long time, is essentially a free particle. All right. Okay, so now you're all experts in solid state physics. Uh, let's talk about the more interesting model, where I'm going to look at what's now called the complex SYK model. All right, so now, and yes. Well, okay, so uh, in a real crystal, there's impurities, there's dislocations, there's dopants, so there's definitely a lot of randomness. Uh, and, uh, but that's really not the reason for us to introduce it here. Uh, as, as we'll see that uh, randomness is really like a crutch to enable to solve things easily. Somehow, it turns out random problems are more easily solvable uh, than non-random problems. Uh, you could take some now, for, for free fermions, it's not a big deal. Uh, whether you, you can certainly solve the non-random problem, too, just by diagonalizing this. Uh, but the one point I just emphasized, the, none of these properties change. The, at this level, they're basically the same, uh, uh, random and non-random systems. Now, when you take a non-random, strongly interacting system, and that's incredibly hard to solve. Uh, and if you try to, uh, try to look at solvable models, either they're have special properties due to integrability, um, or they have some broken symmetry. They go into some kind of crystal or superconductor, a charge density wave, something that you're not interested in. So you want to frustrate all of these familiar things and still get a metal, ordinary compressible state at zero temperature. So the role of randomness, at least in our mind, uh, even in the earliest days, was to just get rid of, it's a way to get rid of what all the, all the familiar things to frustrate the system. But now when you frustrate it, you can't solve it, so we said, okay, let's just take them random. Now I believe, and there is some numerical evidence for this, uh, that even if you took a non-random system with sufficient frustration, many of these properties will hold. Okay. So of course, the, you have the danger of too much frustration. Yes, right. then you get spin glasses. So that's, in fact, when we wrote up, when we, you know, when I came up with the solution in 93, uh, I, I hesitated from publishing it because I said this is something is this is so peculiar it doesn't really make any sense. I'm probably missing some spin glass state, and we spend a lot of time looking for spin glass solutions. Uh, today, people are looking at it again, but it's a bit of a deja vu. We thought of a lot about that in those days, uh, and finally, I was convinced that it wasn't there. Uh, and now, with the numerical studies, it's very clear we were right. So, okay. Uh, also, another property, as we'll see. Uh, the model I'm just going to introduce has very strong self-averaging properties. Uh, it's random, but if you measure it, it won't look random to you, unless you measure it with some exquisite precision. Um, but, you know, uh, of course, if I could solve a land-random problem, I'll do it, and Igor will talk about that, and that also has very similar properties. <laughs> but that, uh, you, you know, that turns out to be much harder to study numerically. The amazing thing about the model I'm going to talk about, it's trivial to study numerically, but it has essentially the same properties as Igor's models. Okay, so let's talk about, so I'll talk about what's called the Q equals four complex SYK. So now the Hamiltonian, again, one over N to the three half this time. Uh, sum on i j k l uh, j i j uh, let me call it u I forget what I call it in the notes uh, c dagger i c j c k c l so again there's a q which is sum on i c dagger i 
which commutes with the Hamiltonian. And so associated with that, I can add a chemical potential, C dagger I, C I. So this is a problem of, you have n sites, and on n sites, uh, you're going to put Q fermions. Uh, and you just want to study the ground state as n goes to infinity uh, of a model where there's only interactions between the fermions. Okay, and, uh, uh, and this we're going to take random, so this is going to be average zero, and unless the all indices are all equal, uh, this, this is basically, no, I should really write it out more explicitly. So it's something like average of uijkl u star i prime j prime k prime l prime average is so u naught squared times you know delta i i prime delta j j prime delta k k prime delta l l prime and a few other terms that are allowed by symmetry u naught squared okay so u is not full in symmetric right there is a yes uh, that's right it's anti symmetrics but k and l and i and j uh, yeah, and then you complex conjugate, and then you can interchange i, j, and k, l, right? Um, so the conventional SYK model is a similar thing with, uh, with Majorano fermions. Uh, okay, I, other people will talk about it, but first, it's not interest to me for the problems I've introduced, uh, uh, mainly because it doesn't have a conserved U1. Uh, and as we'll see, if you want to map it onto charged black holes, actually, this is really crucial, this conserved U1. Uh, it's related to the charge on the dual black hole also. Okay. Yes, that's also different. It's easier. Q equals zero is different. Uh, I mean, it's easier to solve than general Q, uh, but it's uh, it's in fact doesn't map onto a charged black hole as we'll see. Exactly. I mean, there's some other black holes it could map onto. Yeah. All right. Um, so this is the model we want to solve, and it turns out it's uh, in the large and limit, it's almost fully solvable. And in the last few years, a huge amount has been learned even beyond the large and limit. So one basic point I should make here, uh, so this is not a random matrix problem in the conventional sense, because the size of matrix you need to diagonalize this problem is not n by n or n squared by n squared, as you might naively think. It's two to the n by two to the n. So <laughs> it's a many body Hilbert space, has two to the n states. Of course, you can reduce that a big bit by using the conservation of Q, but modulo such effects, they don't affect the exponential. Um, it's a huge matrix, but the number of matrix elements, random matrix elements is you know, of order n to the four. So uh, it's a huge matrix with the highly correlated matrix elements. Uh, now, if you look, as uh, Steve Schenker and others have been showing, if you look some at some e to the minus n precision, eventually even this model shows random matrix statistics, but that's not the level of precision I'm going to talk about. I, I'm going to be looking at things at you know power series and one over n. Uh, and if you, as long as you're looking at things you know which are perturbed in, at the level of one over n or one over n squared from the n goes to infinity limit, the randomness seems to not matter at all. Uh, everything self-averages. I mean, basically the point is that each site. Uh, if you pick any random site, uh, it's coupled to all the other sites, uh, and just the, and and all the other sites are all random, and they basically average out. So if you pick a different site, although it has different couplings, on average it looks the same. Okay. So how do we solve it? Well, we solve it exactly the way I solved the previous model, uh, and I will save you the n counting. It's just again very simple. Uh, you just look at all the graphs, you average them graph by graph. Uh, also, I should say, this is not the way we did it originally. And the reason is that we were worried about things like replica symmetry breaking, uh, which are non-perturbative uh, in U0. Uh, and uh, so, you know, you do have to worry about it, uh, but I'm not going to worry about it here. All right, so if we just look at the graphs, then G, this is the first graph. Uh, then the second graph, uh, has some interaction u here, and three lines, oh, one line coming in, one line going out, uh, and then of course the average of this is zero, 
So you have to have another one uh, with uh, what is that? Something like that. Here's another u naught, and then you have to average over u naught. When you average over u naught, these two get connected, uh, and now you can close the graphs. Um, and now you have i, j, k, l, and i again. Uh, and here you have u naught squared over n cubed. That's why I put an n to the three halves here. And and this sum over j, k, and l give me a factor of n cubed. Okay. So the final answer, uh, you can look at more thoughts of graphs, uh, uh, entertaining a homework problem. Yeah, this is it. This is the only graph. There's only one graph that contributes uh, modulo, of course, uh, dressings inside. So you can put arbitrary number of these melons, as they're called, uh, as many as you want. They all contribute to leading order 1 over n. Okay. And nothing else does. Everything else averaged to 0. So now the equations are g of omega is i omega minus sigma plus mu. And now uh, sigma. I'm going to write it in time space, so this is easier in frequency space. Uh, sigma tau, uh, it turns out to be u squared again. I don't remember the sign. Uh, g squared of tau, g of minus tau. Okay. So the problem is reduce it to solving these two equations. Uh, okay. <laughs> So that they look like, you know, surely someone done that before. That's what uh, I thought when we first wrote these down. This has all been done. Look this up. Uh, just solve these equations up consistently. Uh, and uh, no, so we can solve some things. So we, we did some leading order analytics that I'll describe now. Uh, but we're still learning new things about these equations. They have emergent SL2R and U1 symmetries that are much more, much more clarified now. Uh, and, uh, and, and and because of that, these equations are in fact related to Einstein's equation in certain gravitational uh, contexts. So that's another thing we are understanding today uh, in the past few years. But this is it. Just comes from something Mellon diagrams. Okay. Um, and here, of course, I've introduced, assumed implicitly that GII is independent of I. Uh, okay. There's no off diagonal green spots, and they are down by factors of one over n. All right, so, so we have to solve these equations, and uh, what, so I can just tell you what we know about them. All right, so uh, I should say in the Majorana case, you get the same equations, uh, except you can assume that g of tau is an odd function of tau, uh, and mu is exactly zero. You could also put mu exactly zero here, uh, and the solutions would be similar to the Majorana case, but the fluctuations are different because uh, you also have both symmetric and anti-symmetric channels to worry about in the fluctuations. Uh, at large n limit, it's the same with a factor of two in the entropy and so on. Okay, so what do these equations lead to? So the, first of all, they turn out they lead to a state of matter which is compressible, number one, good. But it turns out a state of matter that has no quasi-particles. Uh, that's great. Uh, so we were all happy about all of this. Uh, but it also turns out to have one property that we weren't looking for, but in the retrospect is turned out to be the most interesting, uh, which is that it has a, a finite entropy as temperature goes to zero. Now I want you to notice I didn't say it has a finite ground state entropy. That's not true. The ground state is basically non-degenerate, as we know from lots of numerical studies today. Uh, but what's different 